everyone. Welcome to Market Guru. Today we are in conversation with Philip Poole, Global Head of Macro and Investment Strategy at HSBC Global Asset Management. Philip, uh, thanks so much for taking out the time. It's good to have you on the show. Let's start with the basics. A huge rally in the Indian markets. It's been a phenomenal last two odd months for the bulls. Announcements have been coming in almost on a daily basis from New Delhi. What's your sense on what's going on here? Well, I think the starting uh, valuations were attractive, you know, on a, on a price to book, on a forward P multiple basis. Uh, the market was trading cheap to its own trading history. So that was a good starting point. Um, but I think what really uh, has, has been a catalyst for that move is obviously the, the government um, announcements of one form or another, you know, starting with what they did on, on uh, diesel subsidies, moving through to, to the FDI and various other measures and, and clarifying really a lot of uncertainty that had been in the market. That's the catalyst for me which uh, has really led to the outperformance of India. Philip, but there are cynics and they say that some of this might start wearing off as we get into next year. It's an election year and then you know, the government getting into its populist mode might actually throw the fiscal mathematics out of the window. Do you share that concern? Well, it's always a concern when, when you have political events on the horizon, uh, not just in the Indian market. I mean, there's always a temptation uh, to ease up uh, fiscally. I think that would be a mistake. Uh, it's certainly to, something to watch for. But, but the reality is there's been a whole series of uh, announcements and a, and a string, if you like, of good news. So uh, I, I think on balance, uh, there's certainly been a, a number of steps forward. That's not to suggest that, that there can't be uh, a few steps back as well. But... I think that um, we're in a much better place than we were, you know, three months ago. Let's put it that way. So having said that, Philip, uh, what's the sense on liquidity or the money flow? Has India got its share of the FII money already on the reform announcements, what, what we've seen in the last two, three months? Or is there still a lot of investor interest in India when you go and talk to people outside? Well, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at the data year to date, it, although that's, that picture's been changing recently, but year to date, there's still been net outflows. Uh, very big differences between the inflows you've seen into ETFs and, and, and the other part of the market. Um, I, I think that a lot of what happens in the future will be dictated by risk appetite. And I think the positive here really is that the, the very short term, high frequency data that we, we're seeing out of Europe, out of the United States, out of China as well, is suggesting that we're seeing a stabilization in the glo global economy. If that's the case, then I think risk appetite can, uh, can, can, can pick up and India will be one of the markets on a flow basis, I think, that would benefit from that. Philip, I, I take your point. What you're saying on data, I mean, what we've seen out of uh, the Chinese numbers this morning, they are not too bad in themselves. But why is it then that we're not seeing any clear moves in the Western markets, neither in Europe nor in US, neither a big move up nor a big breakdown? Are we going to be in this consolidation phase for a long time? Yeah, well, the markets, uh, not just in India, but the markets generally have, have bounced quite nicely year to date. I mean, we already have levels of return which are well in excess of long-term uh, averages. So you can argue it in fact that, that what's happening here really is that the data and the change in the data, uh, the stabilization of the global economy is kind of validating uh, a move in markets that's already happened. It's in a sense, uh, it's already in the price if you like. Uh, and, and I think there's an element of truth in, in that argument. But you know, putting that aside, there's lots of liquidity in the system. You know, we know that QE obviously is pumping more of that liquidity into the system. If it does appear as though these, uh, uh, there's a kind of turning point in the global economic cycle, then I think there will be positive flows going into markets uh, in the emerging economies, into currencies that look cheap, like the rupee, for example. Uh, and, and I do think that, uh, you know, if that's the way it plays out, India will be a beneficiary of those flows. So, Philip, you, you still think the rupee is cheap? Does it still have more headroom on the way up? Well, the rupee on a PPP basis is one of the cheapest currencies uh, around. I mean, if you look at the IMF PPP calculations, uh, it, it really shows as being substantially undervalued. Now, when you make uh, various adjustments to, the, to that, the degree of undervaluation falls from the unadjusted PPP. But nonetheless, it, it appears to us to be one of the, the cheapest currencies still globally. 
Philip, so talking about investor interest, you know, in 2010-11, nobody wanted to come to India. It was markets like Indonesia, Philippines, Turkey. They were the flavor of the season. Now, has that changed now? How is India stacking up against some of these newer uh, sort of, let's say, more, more exotic emerging markets? Yeah, well, we actually like markets that are out of favor. We think that's the time to buy them. Uh, and indeed, um, you know, we were more positive on India um, really before the announcements on a view that valuations had become uh, attractive again. Uh, if we look at other markets on that basis, China looks particularly cheap. China's big, been a big underperformer uh, relative to India, but relative to global markets. So we think the valuations actually in China are attractive. We think the cycle is turning there as well. We've got Q Q3 um, GDP numbers coming through on Thursday. We think that's probably going to be the bottom of this cycle. Uh, and so China certainly would be on, on that list. Um, I think that uh, the Russian market as well continues to look cheap for a number of reasons relative to its own trading history. Markets, you mentioned the Philippines. Markets like the Philippines, for example, uh, like South Africa, like Turkey in the emerging world, uh, these are also interesting markets. They don't look cheap relative to their own trading history, but arguably, certainly in the Philippines, there's a kind of uh, a re-rating story that's playing through. Uh, and I think this, that's the same really in Turkey. So it's a different kind of argument, but we like the macro story. There's been the, the upgrade that's got priced in, uh, the ratings expectations in Turkey, for example, uh, getting priced in as well. So I, I think there's, uh, in, 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 diff for the, in different ways in the emerging economies, you've got a very cheap valuation stories, you've got good positive momentum. Uh, and overall, we, we continue to believe that, uh, you know, longer term, these are markets that can really deliver uh, for investors. Philip, so then talking about India, what sectors do you like here? There's this debate going on whether one should be in the cyclicals, in the industrials, or whether one should actually stick to the old favorites, the consumption story. What, what is it that you'd back? Well, I think the, the, the clarity that we're seeing coming through uh, on some of the infrastructure projects is starting to favor again some of the infrastructure areas. But in terms of consumption, I think there's a big difference still between the staples and the consumer discretionary stocks. Uh, the staples and, and indeed the defensive stocks more generally uh, to us look uh, expensive. Uh, we favor actually the, the discretionary consumer story. We favor some of the domestic cyclicals as well, thinking that you know there is a, a turn in the cycle that's coming through. Uh, and so, um, you know, on, on balance, it, it, it's again looking really at the valuations, where they stand relative to their own trading cycle and trying to buy these, these stocks when they're cheap and uh, rather than when they're expensive. So, but having said that, would you say that you are a lot more comfortable now uh, buying into companies that are, let's say, in large scale port projects or road construction or these mega infrastructure projects that require a lot of capital? I mean, certainly more comfortable than, than where we were, as I say, three months ago before, you know, we, we uh, s saw, we, we've seen the moves that we've, we've seen. Um, because, you know, for too long, really, a lot of these big infrastructure projects uh, were held up. Um, and, I mean, for me, actually, this is critical for India. If India's going to grow in the future, we're going to realize this, this demographic dividend that everyone you know, it, it talks about rightly so, uh, you need that infrastructure spending. You also, interestingly, need a lot of investment in human capital as well to make that story work. So, I mean, critical uh, for the long term is, is the infrastructure and the broader investment uh, 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 theme. Philip, now you've stated earlier you're concerned with inflation being really sticky in India and the last print that we had was a pretty bad number. It was almost touching 8%. Now you've said in the past that the RBI should not be very aggressive in cutting interest rates. But then wouldn't this be a problem for the market? I don't think it should be actually. I think the market should, should welcome uh, what the RBA, RBI has done uh, uh, in recent months. They've, they've, you know, they've, they've been trying to, to bring inflation down. They've resisted. Uh, pressure even to, uh, to to ease, and I think that's the right stance. Um, I, I think that you know there's a temporary element here uh, to what's happened to inflation, and the latest numbers show that up. Energy, in particular, of course, was the issue. Core inflation numbers were better, were stable, uh, and I think uh, you know if the if if the RBI kind of holds fire for a while, 
that will create uh, better opportunities for the future to cut interest rates and to ease more generally. So I think it would be a mistake uh, to, to, uh, to ease too aggressively too quickly. But um, certainly it's possible that that, that, that uh, inflation data starts to to improve in the coming months, creating the opportunity, if you like, to to provide some more support to the economy and, and to, to uh, the potential upturn from easier monetary policy. But I just don't think it's the right time at the moment. So, Philip, then what are you telling your clients about rate-sensitive stocks in the country, whether it's banks or auto stocks? Real estate has started evoking a whole lot of interest in the market off late. Yeah, again, I mean, it, it's, it's about looking at the valuations and trying to, to you know, buy things uh, that are cheap in their own valuation cycles. And, and those sectors uh, certainly uh, uh, fit into that category, for the most part anyway. Um, just when that, value, when that value gets realized is a more difficult question. But it's very, very difficult to, to, to time the market perfectly, you know, to, to second guess what the RBI is going to do and, and buy just ahead of that. So I would say, uh, in line with what I said earlier, really, that getting positioned, if you like, on an expectation that there will be an improvement in the future, even if you're two or three months early, uh, that's, I, I think, the way, the way to think about this. At the end of the day, there's a lot of noise in markets, not just in the Indian market at the moment, but a lot of noise globally. I think the, 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 the challenge for investors is to kind of look through that noise, see, see the trends and position for those trends uh, in, in the medium term. So, I mean, as we sum up the earnings conversation, what are sectors that you categorically right, like right now in India and which are the areas that you definitely stay away from? Yeah, well, as I say, um, for me, the thing that's changed uh, really is uh, we've seen uh, these, these announcements from the government. We've seen uh, uh, fiscal uh, discipline sort of back on the agenda. The RBI, I think rightly so, has held off from cutting interest rates. Uh, relative to their own uh, uh, valuation cycles, we, we believe, as I've, I've already mentioned, that the consumer discretionary stocks uh, look cheap, that m many of the defensives actually look relatively expensive, that things like materials, for example, some of the financials do represent long-term value. Um, and what will be critical in realizing that long-term value will be what happens to global risk appetite, because I think that's the key element here. At the margin, the Chinese, the, the Chinese market, the Indian market, these are markets that are, are driven by the inflows and outflows that come from abroad, and I, I don't think that will change in the, in the short term. So what happens to global risk appetite is critical. As I've uh, mentioned again, we think the global economy is, is starting to find a flaw. The pace of deterioration is, is certainly slowed, and uh, we're not looking for a dramatic rebound, but you know, if we see that stabilization, that can help. Uh, risk appetite that can help markets like India. So on that itself, Philip, do you see the current risk on mood lasting? I mean, it's not a mega risk on rally, but things are kind of holding up. Those bond yields, sovereign yields in Europe are stable. The euro has been holding on to around 130. Do you see this lasting? Well, what's happened really is that the, the ECB announcements uh, in particular, but combined with some moves uh, that we've seen some various governments in, in, in Europe have have reduced the tail risks that were very evident six months ago. Um, we haven't seen the OMT uh, program triggered for Spain yet, but we, we believe that's coming in within the, 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 the next few weeks. Uh, and that, again, will help to, to, to keep a cap, uh, a lid on these yields. So it then becomes uh, uh, a story really about implementation of reforms, of austerity programs, combined with a need for, for Europe to stabilize. And, you know, the, the economy, as, I, as I've already mentioned, really is showing signs finally, in certain parts anyway, of that stabilization. So, you know, if that were to happen and we saw, saw some, uh, uh, some uh, better uh, activity numbers coming through, that would certainly uh, help us uh, uh, in terms of risk on uh, for, the, for the future. But one thing to watch here outside of Europe is the United States. The, the so-called fiscal cliff uh, is an element uh, of uncertainty which is there on many people's radar screens, but it hasn't really impacted so far global risk appetite. That could change in the run-up to, uh, to the elections in, in, in the United States. So that's something to watch. Uh, and, and of course the other factor is what happens to the Chinese data. 
My, my starting point is that uh, it's going to be a soft landing. There is still clearly risks that, that it ends up being harder than that. Uh, all of these factors are, uh, are going to help to shape that global risk uh, uh, environment, which in turn will shape the flows uh, that India gets and, and, and I would argue the nature of a price action in the future. Exactly on the US, Philip, uh, the upcoming November elections, do you see this event having any significant bearing on decision making when it comes to allocation of money, when it comes to what fund managers are thinking? No, I, I, I personally don't think it will have much of an impact. I, I, I would argue, in fact, that um, you know, what the Fed has already done and set out uh, is, is really probably the critical issue uh, in terms of the US from a policy point of view. Um, but, but clearly what's, what is a, a, a drag on US growth is this whole idea that you know, there will be some form of automatic tightening that takes place next year. The fiscal cliff is not going to be as steep as it appears on paper in our view, but there will nonetheless be a, a substantial drag between 1 and 2 percent of GDP probably in terms of fiscal drag on GDP growth uh, next year. So we're looking at a global economy that may well be stabilizing, but it's not going to be growing dramatically uh, in the United States or Europe or Japan or for that matter, uh, China. We, we think that the world has to get used to, in a light, if you like, uh, to uh, a global system that grows less uh, rapidly than it did in the pre-crisis period. And the United States will be part of that story, whether it's uh, uh, all change at the top politically or not. I don't think that makes a, a, a huge difference. Well, that's, that's an interesting point, getting used to a phase of slower growth than the pre-crisis era. Philip, then what does all of this mean for commodities, for oil? That's so important for us here in India. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually still relatively bullish medium term on commodity prices. I think that the continued relatively rapid growth in populous emerging market countries like India and China, Indonesia, uh, these types of markets where urbanization, for example, is an important part of the, uh, of the ongoing development story. All of that is supportive uh, of demand for energy and for metals and m most uh, hard commodities. And I, and I think that story is there for the future just as it's been in the past. These economies probably growing, growing less rapidly than, than pre f the financial crisis, but nonetheless still growing rapidly and that growth still being relatively commodity intensive. And when it comes to oil in particular, uh, there's going to be issues around the Middle East, ongoing issues around the Middle East and the extent to which you know, supply concerns also provide uh, an element of support for the price. So I really think that uh, we're, we're, we're in for a, uh, a future where commodity prices remain supported at relatively high levels in relation uh, you know, to what we, we've seen for most of the last 20 years or so. Okay, Philip, we'll leave it on that note then for now. Thanks so much for joining and great talking to you as always.